following is a video presentation of a worship service at Orville Baptist Church. And thank you, Joan, and welcome to Orville Church. Glad to see each and every one of you gathered here this morning. And those of you that will be later joining us online, we welcome you this Lord's Day. Today will be a little different type of service. We notice that the choir is not in the loft. Uh, here up on the platform, we've allowed them to have a little time off today and join you in the pew. And there's a reason for that. We are actually going to kind of streamline our worship services today because at the conclusion of our service, we're entering into a church conference for a time of discussion about a very important ministry opportunity that Orville Baptist Church is preferably considering. So as we welcome you, let's bow together in prayer. And as you bow in prayer, I will tell you that we will be reading and looking together in just a moment at the text of scripture that I will be preaching from. So you might want to be finding Acts chapter 9 and verse 31. Let's join together in prayer. As we bow together, we lift up our hearts to you, Father, in prayer and praise. As we know, the scripture tells us that it's a great privilege to gather together in person. As you said, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, but even more so as you see the day approaching. And Father, we know we are living in some very troublesome times and anxious moments. 
not only in the life of our nation, but all around the world. And Lord Jesus, we thank you that you give us peace in the midst of trouble. And you told us not to be anxious for anything, but through prayer, with thanksgiving, bring our petitions and requests before you. And so we do so this morning, Lord Jesus Christ, praying for our world, our nation, our community here, and our church. And Lord, we pray that you will fill us with yourself today as we welcome you to speak in us and to us and through us. And may this service and all that takes place in this service today bring honor and glory to your name and edify the church and reach out to those in the community that need Christ. And we pray that all in Jesus' name that you would get the glory. And all God's people said, and amen. Well, look at your uh, Bible and look at Acts chapter 9 because the verse that I'm reading to you this morning as you follow along and I read actually will uh, segue into the two hymns from our hymnal that we'll be singing. See if you can pick up on the two things that are found in this passage of Scripture that the two songs we're going to sing come right out of this verse. Here's the verse. Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace. It was strengthened and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. It grew in numbers living in the fear of the Lord. Did you not find those two phrases that segue right into the two uh, hymns that we're going to be singing today? Well, the two songs we're singing from our hymnal, you know it, and I know it, Revive Us Again. Now, the title of my message is Inside Outside Church. Well, Inside Church has to do with reviving us and being strengthened. And there's nothing greater, I believe, that you can pray for in today's world than for revival. How in the world will we be strengthened in these troubled times? We as a church, you as an individual, I as an individual need to be revived again. So we're going to sing two verses of Revive Us Again. And then we're going to go right into the second part of that verse and sing, Set My Soul on Fire. Now, what is it that we're going to be set, setting our soul on fire for? Well, you'll see that as we'll sing the first and second stanza. And then when that is concluded, I will come back and we'll go right into the message. So Joan, come and lead us as we think about how the strength, the church can be strengthened and how the church can have the, its soul set on fire for the purpose of the work of outside, inside, outside church. Joan, you come. Hymn number 295 followed by 294. Let's stand as we sing. First and last.
Thank you. You may be seated. All right. Let me tell you uh, what happened as we, Joan and I, met uh, this past week. We were not able to meet in person, but we on phone talked about uh, the songs uh, that were going to be selected for today's service. <clears throat> and incidentally, she and I try to meet every week to go over the hymns that she picks and the songs that I think will fit and uh, match what my theme is. And generally, I don't really tell her. Sometimes I give her heads up, like if I'm doing a series, these are the messages in the series. But more often than not, I won't tell her ahead of time. She selected these two hymns and unbeknown to her, I was not going to be doing the series in Genesis, the beginning. Because of this very important church conference today and the discussion that we as a church will be having concerning this ministry opportunity with New Horizon Church that Last Sunday, I shared with the congregation that uh, we have been talking about and praying about. Our deacons and then subsequently our leadership team of our church council leaders met last week and had further discussion as we continue to gather information about the opportunity and the possibilities of partnering with New Horizon Church and allowing them to come and use our uh, chapel area as a place for their worship. They uh, are currently meeting at town center and uh, not able to really accommodate their congregation. They can only have about 30 people at any given time in that little area. And they've been over there for two years. And they have been praying for some time about another location and we begin to talk with uh, Richard Boucher, the pastor, and uh, mention some things to him as a possibility. And so that's how this thing started. And I thought, you know, I, I'm not going to do a message on Genesis. I, I want to talk to you today briefly, and then we're going to enter into our discussion time in this church conference. I want to talk to you first before we look at the this message and talk about inside outside church here in Acts chapter 9 31 I want to remind all of us about the owner of this property <laughs> and uh, the owner of the church because if we're going to have a serious discussion about a partnership with an existing congregation and give them perhaps a ministry opportunity and help them be able to accommodate all their folks. They run about 60 or 65, about like we do. And they just can't get everybody in. But their, their contract is up. Actually, it's up now. <laughs> their lease is over and they're trying to decide what to do, where to go, that sort of thing. But I want to just say to you, and you know this, these verses already. When Jesus established the church... He said, upon this rock, in Matthew 16, verses 18 and following, remember, he told his disciples, asked the disciples, who do men say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And Peter made the great confession, and he said, I know who you are. You're Christ, the Son of the living God. And then Jesus said, upon this rock, I build my church. Now, he was not saying, I'm going to build my church upon you, Peter. A lot of people believe that and think that's the correct interpretation, but that is not. As a matter of fact, Peter himself told us in his epistles, under the direction of the Holy Spirit, who was the cornerstone and who the rock was that Jesus was talking about. Because he says in Peter, Jesus is that rock. Jesus is the cornerstone. And so when Jesus said, and up on this rock... He was referring to himself. He said, I will build my church. That means Jesus is the founder and the owner. Well, where does that put Orville Baptist Church? Where does that put New Horizon Church? And frankly speaking, where does that put every New Testament church in society? Simply this. We have the privilege of being stewards 
of that which he owns. And so I want to make it abundantly clear, and I'm preaching to the choir probably. You already know this because of the lengthy history of Orville Baptist Church. 121 years, the Lord has blessed this place and many souls have come to Christ and the church has grown and has been encouraged and strengthened as outlined there in Acts chapter 9 verse 31. But I know that through the years you understand that the property, these facilities, all of this, we are stewards of God's given resources. And we have and you have made yourself available to be good stewards of these resources. And so as we come into this discussion in just a moment, please again understand that we need to know the mind of Christ concerning this ministry opportunity. We don't own this place. Never have, never will. But let me just commend you by saying you have been good and are good stewards of God's building and God's church. And so I want to say as your pastor, a new pastor, I'm not so new anymore, I've been here about five months, but I want to say God bless you and thank you for your faithfulness in taking care of these resources. Because these resources belong to whom? Come on church. These are God's resources. These buildings belong to whom? These are, this is God's property. And I know the pastors in the past and the congregation as well as you currently understand that we are just here as stewards, not owners. And that's important to understand and acknowledge, especially as we consider how do we use these resources and these buildings now and in the future. And how do we go about looking at perhaps God-led and God-given ministry opportunities such as we're looking at this morning with New Horizon? And so with that as a backdrop, let me just again remind us prior to our discussion about inside, outside church. Because here in Acts chapter 9, it gives us really two primary functions of the church. And let me again remind you that these two functions inside and outside flow out of that great commandment where it says you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul. That means all that we have, all that we are. And understand this when he said, and love your neighbor as yourself, he also goes on to say, uh, understand that one of the things God is looking for, Jesus said in John chapter 4, when he was dealing with the woman at the well, and he talked in terms of worship. And the lady at the well said, well, our folks worship out here on this mountain. And Jesus said, let me tell you what the Father's looking for and desires. Would you really want to know what God desires? The Bible says the Father seeks after true worshipers. So the two functions of the church that are outlined in Acts chapter 9 verse 31 flow out of a heart of worship. Because you cannot truly be a true worshiper of God and not do these two functions. And so let's look at these two functions and I'm going to be brief so that we can enter into our discussion time and hopefully get you out of here in ample time to have lunch. I know some of you probably got reservations and we said if we have a church conference right after the sermon and we typically get out around 11.30 or maybe 10 minutes beyond that, uh, and going to a church conference, who knows how long that's going to be. People start wielding in their seats and passing out. We don't want that. <laughs> so I, I, that's why we abbreviated things. And I hope you understand that and appreciate that. I do as a pastor and I'll, I'll try not to be long-winded. I'll, I'll try to do like Elizabeth Taylor told her husband, I won't keep you long. <laughs> no, I shouldn't have said that. Please forgive me, Lord. <laughs> Inward. 
here are two words I want you to write down, inside, outside. The first word, as we think about inward or inside the church, what is the word we're looking for? How do you strengthen and encourage the church? The word is edify, edification. Inside is edification. And what we try to do as a church, and this church has done through the years, is to learn to build up one another in the holy faith. Edification comes from that word edifice, meaning to build, to build up. Let me give you a couple of verses you can jot down as we're looking at inside church. 1 Corinthians 3, 9. You are God's building. The scripture says, 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 5, I've already made reference to this. You are the living stones built together as a spiritual house. And of course he said the chief cornerstone is Jesus. And so these verses again are references to the fact that we are described as an edifice, a building. There are many names given to the church, a building, a bride, the body of Christ. But for our purposes this morning, we're thinking about how do we build up? How do we become strengthened? How do we encourage one another? And so the inward edification has to do with growing. Say that word with me. Growing. Part of building up is you and I in the strengthening, encouraging process, need to always be growing. And that's an inside job. And that's why we have uh, Sunday school classes and various ministries in our church. That's why you have a pastor shepherding the sheep, teaching you. One of my primary responsibilities is what I'm doing this morning, teaching and feeding the flock. Why? Because I want you to grow. I don't want you to remain the same spiritually, do you? You need to grow up in Christ. Now, here's something I want you to write down, and I want you to think about this. Put your thinking cap on. God will not work through the church until we let God work in the church. And that's why that song, Revive Us Again, is so important to sing and consider in these days especially. The devil does his very best to keep you and keep me from growing in the faith. Now, you understand that when you build a building like these buildings, there are some things that are critical in the success of a building. It's important, number one, and these are found in Ephesians chapter 2, 19 and following. You can look at that a little later. But number one, the foundation. If you don't have a solid foundation, that building, I don't care how tall you build that building, it will never be stable. And Jesus referred to that when he said building your house upon the rock or building your, ha your house upon the sinking sand. The foundation is critical. Now, who is and what is the foundation of Orville Baptist Church? Now, you might think in terms, well, we poured a foundation on all these buildings and you have to dig deep. You can't be, you know, uh, skimpy about digging down before you can build up. You've got to have a stable foundation. Well, Jesus is the foundation. You know what it says in 1 Corinthians 3.11, No other foundation that can be laid than that which is laid, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our foundation. And then Colossians 3 verse 7, we are built up in and on him. So the foundation's important. And then secondly, when you and I think about edifying and building up and thinking about a building inside, we're thinking about the framing of the house. Verse 21, listen to this. In whom... All of the building, now we're not talking about in terms of these structures, we're talking about you as the building. We're the church. When we leave these premises as Orville Baptist Church, when we walk out of these doors a little later on this morning, the church would have left the property. We came in this morning as a church. These buildings, as blessed as we are to have them, this is not the church. Buildings do not constitute the church. Constitute the church. 
it, it, we are called a building because it's an analogy on what the Lord is doing to the body of Christ. In whom all of us are fitly framed together. We can do more for the cause of Christ together than we can ever do by ourselves. I think that's going to be one of the upsides if we move forward with New Horizon Church that we'll have an opportunity to come together and do more together than we can ever do apart. And I think that's one of the upsides to considering this ministry opportunity. And so we need to do everything we can to build up one another. Say, would you rather be part of the construction crew building up or the demolition crew tearing down? I've met some folks along the way and the, my experience as a pastor Sadly to say, there have been a few along the way. They've done everything they could to be part of the demolition crew. Uh, negative all the time. Tearing people down. Listen, we, we're not in the business of tearing one another down. We're in the business of building one another up. Encouraging. That's what Acts says. Strengthen. Encourage one another. 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 26, Paul said, Let all things be done to build up, to edify. Now, before we look at, lastly at this outside church, let me just quickly tell you some of the tools that the Lord has put into our possession to help us with the framing of the house. Tool number one is found in 1 Corinthians 13. The greatest tool in our box that the Lord has supplied us with is a word spelled L O V E. What does that word spell? Love. He says, what if you become a, a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal and have all the gifts and this sort of thing? He said, without love you're nothing. And this will by all men know you if you love one another. And so one of the most important things about Orville Baptist Church that I have found out through the years is that this has been a very loving congregation. I've heard from past pastors. I've heard from transitional pastors, the interim. And each one of them said the same thing. Oh, this congregation loves one another. And you cannot have a church that's going to grow, go, grow without that love. Love and then, of course, faith. That goes without saying. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. You and I cannot strengthen one another and grow and encourage one another without faith in Christ. With Him, all things are possible. And the reason why we have these buildings here through the years is has come upon the heels of faith. It's been demonstrated by the people of God who've believed God in faith and they have moved in faith to build these buildings and have ministry. Isn't that wonderful? And we rest upon and stand upon the shoulders of those men and women of con this congregation years ago that have demonstrated faith in Christ just as you are demonstrating faith in Christ. And something else in these, this toolbox. Love, faith, and those spiritual gifts. Now to his credit, your former pastor, Brother Trey, did something that I fully support and glad he did. A lot of churches have moved away in recent years from a number of committees. Now, standing committees uh, still are valuable and a valuable resource to churches. And some churches have a balance between co standing committees and ministry teams. For my purposes as your pastor, even if you have a standing committee, I like to call them a ministry team because in essence, everything we do should be ministry related. So in the future, if we end up adding any additional teams, we will inform you about that. But I already, as your pastor, see the possibility of maybe adding one or two more ministry teams in the future. But what Trey did, I have done in churches throughout my history as a pastor. 
I've always tried to have congregation as they grow to understand and know their spiritual giftedness. We're all wired differently. We all have different personalities, unique personalities. God has wired us all that way, but we're wired differently. He also has, according to the Holy Spirit, equipped us as he sees fit to give us spiritual gifts. To exercise those giftings and those passions that God has given to individuals that make up the church. And it's vital as you and I move forward and continue to grow and be strengthened to discover and operate in those spiritual giftedness. And I, as your pastor, have some additional resources to aid us in discovering uh, things about your personality, uh, things about your passion, uh, what your spiritual mix is, uh, what your experiences are, and your abilities are. And taking all of that uh, that, that composite study, it makes up who you are. And the sooner you discover that, you understand why you think the way you think. Why there are different opinions when you come to a subject matter. Why you see things differently than your uh, fellow parishioner sees. Nothing wrong with that. God gives us all different insights and personalities. And when we have discussions in business conferences, you see that come up. Somebody says, well, I think this. And another person says, well, I think that. Why, do, why the differences? It's because you've been wired and your motivation and your passion and your giftedness, your perspective is different than my perspective. And I need everybody's perspective. That's why it says we fitly join together. We need everybody coming together under the Holy Spirit as we make decisions. And God uses your personality, your spiritual gift, your motivation, your passion as part of that. So growing in the Lord and strengthening, that's an inside job. But that leads me to, in conclusion, tell you if that's where it stops, we missed it. The church is not just about growing you. The church is not just about growing me. The church is not just about our holy huddle. Me and my three and no one else. The Bible clearly teaches that he expects the church to grow and he expects the church secondly to go. That's the outside multiplication. So the second word is multiply. Now, you know and remember in Acts chapter, uh, the first couple of chapters, especially in chapter 2 through 6, I understand that your previous pastor, former Pastor Trey, took you through the book of Acts. Is that right? And I understand he, he was there quite some time to take you through, so he covered it probably in depth. So this is a review to you. He says that in Acts chapter 9 that the church not only was strengthened and encouraged the inside job, but it grew in numbers. The church that Jesus founded was expected to grow numerically. Now when you come to Acts chapter 2, it says, and there were added to the church 3,000 souls. Chapter 4, 5, they were added 5,000 souls and men and women and children. And then when you come to chapter 6 and going forward, the church no longer is mentioned in terms of adding. The church has since that day been multiplying. It says the members multiplied. The disciples were multiplying. The church since the beginning of its inception to 2021 and in the future until Jesus comes will always be exponentially multiplying. But in order for that to happen... We must not only be a growing church, we must be a going church. How do we do that? Well, this church has done this throughout our history. There are really two primary ways you and I can outwardly multiply. First, publicly. By that I mean we have worship services, events such as revivals or Bible conferences and ministry opportunities where we engage the public. On any given Sunday, throughout the history of this church, I'm certain there have been people that have come to the worship service that came in 
and you presented to them a ministry to a lost soul and they walked the aisle and they were saved. How many of you have seen that happen in this church at Orville Baptist Church? Isn't that wonderful? To come in, have a worship service, and in that public worship service, someone is converted. I tell you, that, that excites a preacher. That excites the church. Nothing more exciting than to see souls saved. Amen? Wouldn't you love to see in the future a day where the numbers are multiplying and people come to a worship service and walk the aisle when we give the invitation and they repent and come to Christ? The Bible says there's rejoicing in heaven in one that repents. And so that's publicly, worship services, special services and events. And hopefully and prayerfully we'll have one of those in the future in September as we pray about having a Bible conference. Obviously that will help grow us inside, but we hope that people will come to Christ during that Bible conference. Now as we think about uh, the possibility and opportunity for a partnership with New Horizon Church, can you imagine what... The folks in this community, when they drive by, see the additional cars lined up in the parking lot, they're going to say, what in the world's going on over there on that property? And maybe they'll come to visit our church or New Horizon and, and be gloriously saved. So think about that. That's a partnership so that we can go and have ministry, public ministry, public multiply. And then lastly, personally. You see... I have people I need to win to Christ. Do I not? You have somebody you need to win to Christ. And one of the greatest ways to multiply is doing it one-on-one. -on -one. People are lost. We just sang that stanza from Set My Soul Afire when it said millions grope in darkness waiting for your word. Well, who's going to give them that word? Jesus said, go and make disciples. And that's my and your personal responsibility. And you and I need not only to be concerned about what and how you can grow and be revived and get ready for heaven. How can we help others to get ready for heaven? And so, opportunities that we have when People come to the CAC and pick up a bag on Monday or Friday or any other time. That's not just to help them materially and physically. We've got to be able to offer them something that is greater than what the world can offer them. Because they can get that anywhere else in the world and they do. There are, there are literally thousands upon thousands of social institutions around America. And rightly so. But what is it that we as a church can give them that a social program cannot give them? We can give them the gospel in hopes that their soul might be saved and they'll be ready for heaven. Because one day they're going to leave this world. And no matter how many handouts and what they've gotten in this world, if they leave without Christ, they go into a godless eternity and no, uh, no distribution that we have ever given them will matter as much as giving them an opportunity to respond to why Jesus came into this world to save them. Jesus said, I've come to seek them out, to seek and to save that which is lost. Do you believe people are still lost today? Do you believe that? Raise your hand if you do. I tell you, the dark world we live in is getting darker. And I see more and more the lostness of humanity, don't you? And we need to be able to be like that shepherd that says, he left the 99 in the sheepfold to go look for the one. That's our responsibility. We as individual church members, Christians, need to seek out that one and bring them into the fold. We need to be like that father who was looking out and waiting for and praying for the return of the prodigal son who found his way back home. Mm -hmm.